Professor Dr. Sendhil Murugan. He has completed his BDS in 1997 from Vinayaga Missions Dental College, Salem, and his MDS from Ragas Dental College, Chennai in 2003. He has an extensive knowledge on cancer surgery and microvascular reconstruction. It's very difficult to find people who is good in both cancer resection and reconstruction, especially microvascular reconstruction. Sandil Murugan is unique in that he does cancer surgeries as well as the microvascular reconstructions himself. He has undergone a lot of training in reconstructive microsurgery from 2004 to 2006. Currently, he holds the post of professor at Savita Dental College, Chennai. His area of interest is in the microvascular reconstruction for pathology. He has many publications in this topic. He visits almost 12 institutions um, in India for performing microvascular surgeries. So he is invited speaker in many forums to talk on this topic. Something unique about him is he travels quite a lot to perform these surgeries in other institutions, but he doesn't charge for these services. So this shows how broad-minded and service-minded is Dr. Sintal Murugan. And uh, he has been I mean, specializing in microvascular surgery almost for the past 10 to 15 years or more than that. So I think he's the right person to moderate today's uh, webinar. We welcome you, Dr. Sindhil Murugan. Dr. Siddharth Chakrabarti is a panelist. He's from Calcutta. He has completed his BDS from uh, in the year 2003 and 2004. Uh, MDS from Ragas Dental College in the year 2009 under the able guidance of Professor Dr. Gunasilan Rajan and Dr. Virabahu. And he did not stop with the MDS. He went ahead to do surgical management of oral cancer a fellowship at Sri Lanka in the year 2012 and 13. Then he did fellowship in Indian Board of Oral and Maxillofacial Surgery in the year 2018. And he also did fellowship in head and neck reconstruction at Shanghai Hospital in 2019. So he has got an extensive training in cancer surgeries and reconstruction. He is also specialized in multiple surgeries, multiple specialties like cranial maxillofacial trauma, pathologies, dentofacial deformities, infections, implants, and so on. So he's a very versatile surgeon, I would say. Then we have Dr. Lakshmi Narayanan for the day. He has completed his BDS from NTR University Vijayawada in 2006, and uh, MDS from Meenakshi Ammal Dental College Chennai in 2010. He's well-trained in surgical oncology. He uh, got his training from uh, Malabar Cancer Center, Kerala. And he also has completed fellowship in head and neck oncology, Hubli, Karnataka in 2001, 11 and 12. He has worked in Tata Memorial Hospital, Mumbai. He's trained in microvascular surgery from Amrita Institute, Kerala in 2011 and from Johnson & Johnson Institute, Chennai in 2015. He has worked at Meenakshi Amal Dental College as a faculty. He has several publications and has delivered several lectures on this topic. He is currently a consultant in Madras Cancer Care Center and many other private hospitals at Chennai. So we are waiting to share your knowledge with us, Dr. Lakshmi Narayanan. We welcome you. Thank you, Professor Suresh, sir, for this wonderful introduction. I'm Thank delighted you. to be here as uh, the moderator for this wonderful session. I should be very grateful and thankful Dr. Jimson for uh, offering the wonderful opportunity to share the thoughts with our panel. And uh, I really thankful to Dr. Reena John for uh, being the president uh, who's given the opportunity to uh, conduct this webinar. And Jimson has taken a tremendous effort in make this uh, COVID time very productive, though he's not in the country at at present and uh, thus he has brought uh, so many uh, webinars uh, to make the uh, fraternity more full uh, uh, useful for the PGs and the aspiring uh, maxillofacial surgeons who want to endure this uh, fraternity. So with this uh, I really thankful uh, for the, all the panelists who has given the extended their support to 
conduct this uh, uh, panel discussion smoothly. So, first, Dr. James Badlani, good morning and and welcome him for this uh, wonderful uh, presentation. And uh, I think we can straight away go for the presentation right now. Good morning, Dr. James. Good morning. Thank you for having me. So, once again, thankful to the Tamil Nadu branch uh, Maxwell Facial Fraternity and Dr. Jimson for this dynamic effort is being taken. And uh, next slide, please. This is the expert panelist is going to discuss about the cases that we are going to have. Uh, I would like to request Dr. James Padilani to brief this case, uh, how to handle this case and how it is being done, usually in this unit. Yeah. Dr. James. Uh, thank you. This is a 66-year-old <clears throat> lady who's got a uh, SCC of the mandible uh, anteriorly, and it's going onto the ventral surface of the tongue. So it's including the flow of the mouth. And it's also uh, very close to the chin. And uh, in fact, you would say the chin is involved as well. So she had a composite resection there of the chin, mandible, flow of the mouth, and ventral surface of the tongue. So uh, the reconstruction options here, uh, firstly, I would like to put it out there uh, as to what you all would do. But uh, in this case, uh, we considered a fibula, but uh, her perineal artery was very calcified. So I decided to do a composite uh, uh, flap here, uh, and uh, essentially it was a scapula free flap. Uh, so we replaced the bone and uh, the skin on the chin was uh, replaced with uh, the parascapula uh, paddle there and uh, the alveolus and the uh, flow of the mouth was reconstructed with the lat doci. Now, uh, you know, this was a case where I learned quite a bit from. Uh, instead of just taking the lat doci, I should have taken the skin paddle overlying that, uh, which is called the uh, T DAC flap, so the thoracodosal uh, uh, sort of artery uh, perforator flap there. Um, because that, that gave her a bit of tethering. The other thing uh, with this lady was that, uh, if you can move to the next slide, if that's all right. So, uh, yep, so that's the chimeric flap there and um, just the view of uh, the post-op uh, CT scan that we did. And uh, if we just move on again, if that's all right. So, uh, yeah, so essentially uh, you can see how the flow of the mouth there is a bit tethered. She still did have good function and she was able to swallow, but I feel like it would have been better uh, if, it, if there was skin inside the mouth there. Now, uh, for muscle flaps inside the mouth, if it's just the alveolar region, uh, I still use uh, muscle only there because it just mucosalizes really well. But if it's encroaching onto the flow of the mouth, uh, or uh, in, in this case also the uh, inner aspect of the lip, then uh, skin would be better. Next slide. So, yeah. So this is a second case. Uh, this is a subtotal glossectomy. Uh, <clears throat> and uh, it basically, the resection uh, included pretty much all of the mouth, uh, sorry, all of the tongue, uh, and uh, just the um, base of the tongue on the left-hand side was um, left behind. Now, um, and the inner aspect of the mandible was taken as well to get a margin. So uh, the point I want to make here is that uh, these uh, can be, you know, uh, fairly reliably reconstructed uh, with an AOT free flap, but there are a few concepts that uh, one needs to be uh, cognizant of. One is uh, you need to restore 
uh, the uh, flow of the mouth, the platform there. So where the mile or how it would be. Uh, so just to hold the flap in place and it doesn't uh, drop back into the oropharynx and uh, the hypopharynx, which would cause uh, uh, issues with breathing, swallowing. And um, so what is done here is uh, the AOT is used to reconstruct the tongue. So that becomes the neo tongue and uh, the fascia lata of the flap is uh, uh, essentially, um, if we move on to the next slide. One minute. Yeah. Yeah, please. please, please. Uh, <clears throat> So, so the fascia lata is used uh, um, to create the flow of the mouth, as I've said, and uh, it's essentially secured to the mandible using sutures there. Uh, in this case, I've used two of proline. So you have to um, make holes in the uh, lower part of the mandible and hitch the uh, fascia lata there. But the most important thing is here, if we, sorry, if we go back to the previous slide is the hyoid stitch. So on the bottom left hand side, you can see uh, a picture which shows that the hyoid bone uh, with an arrow um, towards the symphysis of the mandible. Uh, now that hyoid bone needs to be uh, hitched up to the uh, symphysis area of the uh, mandible. And the reason for that is so that you open the oropharynx and the hypopharynx at the back. Otherwise, once again, the, um, the soft tissue will just collapse back there and impede function, uh, including they'll potentially have breathing trouble. Now, most of these patients, if we go to the next slide again, thank you, but they do fairly well. I mean, uh, their speech is of course uh, affected, but you can still understand them and their swallowing is a bit variable. And in this case, this guy uh, did pretty well with speech path. However, you know, sometimes um, they don't do well and they aspirate. And in that case, um, you know, uh, the unfortunate thing is that they probably need a pharyngeal laryngectomy. It sounds very um, uh, aggressive, but if they're aspirating and do not have any mobility there, that's unfortunately, the end point for those patients. So, uh, next slide, thanks. Yeah, one minute. Dr. James, it was a fantastic outcome that you have given. The first two cases I've left for first and second cases, I didn't uh, interrupt in between. Uh, because first is uh, like, uh, it is a compost resection, which means involving all the soft tissue components as well as the bony component. So second is, though it is exclusively on the second, I mean, soft tissue, it incorporates the bony part also. So with this, I would like to uh, throw this uh, uh, discussion to the panelists. Let me start with uh, Shakti, Shakti Diora. Please enlighten on this. Dr. Shakti. Yes, sir. I'm, I'm, I'm here. So it is a very nice uh, presentation, I think, from uh, Dr. Badlani, sir. So I agree with the uh, kind of reconstruction he has provided and taken a call for scapula free flap because as he said, uh, it required a chimeric flap which is uh, very well been given by the scapula wherein uh, the muscle cover, intraoral, when we give a muscle, it usually beautifully it undergoes mucosalization and it, it doesn't give a skin taste also. So I think that is the best thing and very nice reconstruction has been done from my side. Shakti, why don't you think about uh, free fibula apart from this reason that he has uh, insisted on uh, the sclerotic uh, changes that has taken place in the peroneal vessels. Why don't you think about uh, fibula if at all if it is normal? What is your opinion on this? Yeah, so as uh, Sir said, it's a very composite defect wherein there's an intraoral defect and where there's an extraoral defect. So at times when we cover the skin inside the mouth, there are chances that there's a lot of bulk inside because fibula every time we need to cover with a skin paddle. Number two, we need to take probably a big skin paddle which covers the intraoral as well as the extraoral defects. Next thing is the patient always gets and skin taste in the mouth because of the skin which is placed in the mouth. 
So that is very irritable to the patient. Next thing, the patient usually they develop the hair growth in the mouth because of the skin flaps. So many a times again that is very irritable to the patient. So when we give a patient, when we try to rehabilitate or reconstruct a patient, we need to keep this point in mind that how the flap will behave post-operatively. Next, whenever we try to rehabilitate future, uh, future in the dental implants, I think if there's a mucosation have happened, it is easy to place the implant rather than putting uh, on the skin uh, flap, on the fibula, where there's a cover with the skin paddle putting the dental implant. So I think uh, that is what uh, I have would have taken a call. I agree with the Badlani sir to uh, scapula will be a better choice for this patient. Dr. Lakshmi. Okay. Good morning, everyone. Oh, this patient, uh, uh, he has a composite defect with the central arch segment. Uh, like there is a central arch defect. There is a floor of mouth and tongue defect as well as the skin defect. So any flap that will give some amount of uh, bulk to the floor of mouth and tongue, replace the central segment and skin will be okay. So if not for uh, calcified uh, peroneal artery, I'll still go in for uh, a fibula flap, osteocutaneous uh, flap. And uh, regarding uh, there, the muscle usually undergoes atrophy and uh, there will be a lot of uh, contracture from the muscle. So if no skin, there will be a lot of contracture. So I would have uh, uh, opted for a fibula osteocutaneous flap in this case, if uh, the perineal artery is fine. Dr. Sindhal, you're muted. Sorry. Dr. Siddhar, uh, uh, do you want to uh, second the same or you want to tell something on without reconstruction with the bone, just secure the tongue muscles and put a soft tissue fullness either with the ALT flap or rectus abdominis flap. Do you want to say something on this or you want to second no, sir, this? I, sir, I, I, am, uh, I am seconding the panel list because if you put a soft tissue flap there, the patient will develop an antigum. And definitely the patient will have issues on the falling back of the tongue and issues of breathing and swallowing. So Fantastic. we need a we need a bony reconstruction for the mandible or anterior arch, and that should be the goal, whatever bone flap you use. And it depends upon the operator preference for the soft tissue. If I am the operator, I will put the flexor hallucis longus on the floor of the mouth to recreate the floor and the skin paddle outside to recreate the skin. And of course, I'll be going for the fibula, the work was flat. Okay, now the take home message is, for this patient, what we can do is, uh, since it's osteomyocutaneous defect, after the resection, uh, we need to reconstruct the osteomyocutaneous component and cutaneous part outside the skin. And intraorally, as uh, Dr. Shakti Diora said, intraorally, just leave the flexor hallucis muscle for granulation to become a mucosa mucos soon so that the dental implants uh, placement will be easy for the operator. And uh, as the patient did not ha have uh, proper uh, consistent, uh, consistent anatomy in the peroneal vessels, uh, Dr. James has chosen this uh, scapula flap. Otherwise, fibula osteomyocutaneous flap, flap will solve this uh, total issue. So that is the choice of uh, flap for this patient. Composite effect maxillomandibular defect, osteomyocutaneous choice will be the fibula followed by scapula and or uh, iliac uh, osteomyocutaneous flap. Coming to the second case of Dr. James, that can you display that uh, second case? Yeah, it's a subtotal glossectomy. It's complete loss, almost complete loss of the tongue, the result of cancer. And uh, uh, he has reconstructed, uh, next one. So, Shakti, what will be your choice of flap for this patient, Dr. Shakti Dior? Uh, yeah. Yes, sir. Uh, I think the choice of flap for this reconstruction is the ALT free flap, which is the adequately reconstruct the soft tissue component of the whole tongue. And uh, there, there, there's a special technique, I mean, there's a technique which has been mentioned in the literature by name 
montare flap wherein we are uh, we are uh, you know designing the flap in a way that how it will be inserted into the mouth so ald gives us the best reconstruction when we are doing this kind of reconstruction and for participants i think uh, uh, they they what need... kind of what kind of plan you prefer like uh, you want to make it as a myocutaneous component or only the suprafacial dissection with the subcutaneous tissue alone what would be your line of uh, management i'll take perforator, what... perforator based alt will suffice for this perforator based alt without any muscle we, component muscle fine 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 yeah. dr siddhar sir i like to go with the vastus lateralis with this because a tongue has such a huge defect tongue will always need a volume and there will be a lot of dead space we have to cover so i'll be going for the vastus lateralis along with it of course a perforator brace but i'll take a good amount of vastus lateralis along with it to give it a good volume so you are that means you are just reconstructing the floor with the vastus lateralis yes, and vastus the skin lateralis and dr lakshmi on the dr lakshmi okay. i will consider the patient built in this case my of course my choice of uh, flap will be alt because uh, the only thing we can do here is create tongue bulk functional tongue mobility is not possible uh, so i'll be considering patient built if he is a thin patient i can uh, take the whole facio cutaneous uh, alt and then uh, put it there or if the patient is very bulky patient then we have to go for a suprafacial uh, alt and uh, we have to always make sure that in this case we are doing neo mandibular suspension to uh, avoid post operative aspiration and speed up the uh, swallowing rehabilitation process dr james i would like to, i like to ask one question from you one is that uh, why don't you think about uh, if at all if alt is not possible for all the operator to execute why don't you think about sensate radial forearm uh, Superficial dissected flap with involving the lateral cutaneous branch, so that you can restore the form and function of the tongue, and the patient can at least move the tongue to some extent. Sensory sensation is restored to some extent. What is your yeah. opinion, Doctor? Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm, I'm sure that would work in your your hands. But uh, I, m- m- my concerns would be one is bulk and. Uh, Two is also uh, creating that flow of the mouth sort of scenario. Uh, the fascia lata just secured to the uh, mandible there will just prop the flap up. Uh, if you don't prop that, they, the patients would have some form of ptosis here. So uh, that's the reason why I would go for uh, uh, an AOT in this case. Uh, but, you know, um, a lot of flaps have been described here and, uh, you know, one would be rectus abdominis. Uh, but once again, you don't create that, uh, f- uh, the flow of the mouth, but you could harvest the fascia lata by itself and do what uh, is, uh, uh, that I've just described. And, you know, uh, some literature has come out and, uh, it, it, I mean, a lot of, uh, Uh, places in India are doing it is the Grisalis one, but dynamic sort of uh, reconstruction there to the hypoglossal there. But once again, you know, in a total tongue, I, I, I find that a bit hard to uh, consider really. Fantastic. Now, uh, the take home message for this case is concerned. Uh, sensate flap of, uh, from the radial for a facial cutaneous flap is the choice, but predominantly opinionated by the panelists is because of the tissue bulk reconstruction of the floor of the mouth as well with the single flap is feasible with the cld flap and uh, the component wise one is whether to include muscle or only the facial cutaneous part facial cutaneous part is not involving the muscle like a uh, vastus lateralis i mean rectus from the muscle vastus lateralis there is with muscle can give a, it is called chimeric flap dual blood supply which is going inside and giving a, a separate perforator for the muscle so such huge flap can be used for reconstruction of the tongue as well as the floor of the mouth simultaneously with single flap that's why uh, the sensate flap of radial forearm is denied in this case fine next case dr sentel can i interfere yeah. raise here yeah, yeah yeah please there is one question on this particular case uh, uh, from Fine. one dr rahul singh yeah. so he asks why not a dcia flap for this case 
Any uh, di- yeah. Uh, or panelists want to answer this, or shall I answer? You can start, Sandil, the... and we'll get the yeah. opinion from others too. Yeah, uh, it's a fantastic idea. Bold stock is fantastic with the Iliac Crest. Number one. Yes. Second is no need to go for double barrel if you think about a fibula. Yes. But the problem is the pedicle length is very short with your deep circumflex iliac artery and the vein. Multiple osteotomies is not giving that much of uh, promising results when you compare the fibula flap. Fibula, you can do seven, five osteotomies as okay. long as you preserve the periosteum very carefully. And yes. the setback with your uh, iliac crest is long span of defect like this. You have to suppose if you are reconstructed the angle to angle man, so much of bone has to be lengthwise you have to take it from the ilium. And when you compare the donor site morbidity, fibula is much, much more safer than your uh, deep yeah. circle that they have flap. Wearing the garments, disharmony, imbalance in walking, unless you are able to meticulously close the anterior uh, inguinal ligament and anterior, repair the uh, anterior superior iliac spine. Uh, really, it's a challenging club as far as my part is. And the caliber size, caliber size is almost uh, one and a half times lesser than what you are doing for a fibula. The solid two two millimeter uh, vessel you can obtain from the uh, your uh, fibula. More yes. than three millimeter of peroneal vein you can take, which is not that much at this. So these are uh, considering all the post-operative morbidity, donor side morbidity, and of course, if it is a straight graft, small uh, small uh, defect. Then you can think about uh, iliac crest. Nothing yeah. wrong in that. Okay. So any difference of opinion, Doctor James, Doctor Siddharth, Lakshmi, one by uh, one. I like to I like to add one another point to it that when you are harvesting a iliac crest bone graft along with a skin panel, you have to dissect through the external oblique muscle also, and the flap becomes quite thick. When you are harvesting the fibula, the skin is very quite pliable also. That I think that's another point we can add with this. What is your opinion, sir? Dr. James. Yeah, look, uh, yeah, it, 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 is, um, it is doable. But uh, look, uh, as uh, Dr. Senthil and uh, Dr. Siddharth have mentioned, you know, it is uh, uh, quite bulky uh, reconstruction and the pedicle length is quite small. And uh, uh, look, even if you... Uh, don't use the skin paddle and just use muscle inside the mouth and also for the chin and put a skin graft, the aesthetic results won't be as good, uh, I think. Okay. Dr. Lakshmi, you want to add something on this? No, Dr. James summarized it very well. And uh, you have told in briefs, uh, the donor site morbidity with the DCIA is more and uh, the ease of harvesting of fibula is like we are all uh, well versed in doing this so both taking together uh, preference wise is people fine fantastic so mandible defect classical uh, flap will be your theory fibula osteomyocutaneous flap depends upon the content you choose either you go for osteocutaneous flap or osteomyocutaneous flap depends upon the requirement that you choose for benign lesions most of the time we take only bone alone bone alone flap or called bone only flap so there won't be any uh, soft tissue component with that except the pedicle there won't be any soft tissue component at all whereas comes to the cancer surgeries we lose lot of tissue that's why we call it as composite resection skin mucosa teeth bone everything is lost so we have to give the fullness as well as to restore the function of the tongue which is being held on the medial side of the mandible. So in that case, you have to go for osteomyocutaneous flap. The muscle part will give the bulk, bulkness for the volume to the, the defect, restore the defect. And the, the skin will give a cover either intraorally or extraorally or sometimes both. So that is best achieved by your free, free fibula flap. And the second is multiple osteotomies. If you want to, if you want to, uh, if you want to class it, if you want to make a multiple osteotomies to reconstruct the angle to angle mandible or you make a curve venture of the mandible then fibula flap will be the ideal for and you can can safely be performed uh, within the donor site itself so that you can maintain the ischemic time uh, that is one one thing we are going to discuss at the end of the session so that is the uh, this wide 
ilia crest or scapula or denied one is prime concern is the donor sheath morbidity that you have to take into consideration and anatomically the size of the length of the pedicle of deep circumflex iliac artery is small and the caliber size is small and we have to explore the anterior superior iliac vein where the inguinal ligament and the other muscles are to be sort of attached so those things to be meticulously closed or uh, eventually may if it is not done if it may go for a post operative complications like uh, disarmony or hernia those kind of things can happen so the take home message is any mandible defect think about prefibula myocutaneous flap or osteocutaneous flap or if you want to reconstruct only soft tissue with the fibula you can go with the uh, uh, isolated soft tissue flap which can also alleviate the need for the other upper limb like radial forearm flap that is the take home message next slide Yeah, that is being yeah. Next slide. Sorry, if we go to the previous slide, yeah, no, yeah. yeah, and the previous one, thanks. Yeah, so this is a young chap, twenty-one years old. Uh, he had an aggressive cyst in the left mandible there, and uh, within six months it had recurred, and you can see. Uh, the OPG on the bottom there, it um, was you know fairly close to the lower part of the mandible. So um, he, he's young. There was uh, plenty of uh, intraoral um, gingival, which was fairly healthy, that we decided to leave there. Um, and we planned for a DCIA. So this was uh, planned with uh, our director here, uh, Professor Sambrook, and uh, we used a 3D planning system here. So uh, I just put this up just to show that, you know, with technology, we um, can take away a lot of uh, sort of the guesswork that sometimes goes into reconstructing it on the table. And it also saves time because, you know, you can print the uh, plate and you can have the cutting guides, everything done. So it just fits like a glove. Um, and, uh, you know, uh, it's companies like Striker that we, um, sort of uh, look to and they provide uh, their engineering staff where it helps us to facilitate the planning. And, you know, we can uh, take um, and position the graft where we uh, would ideally like it for implant placement as well. So uh, for this uh, patient, uh, we decided to do a DCIA because of the bone stock and uh, for, you know, it'll give us a good form and uh, would help us to rehabilitate the patient well and um, give him good function at the end of the day. So, um, yeah, so a DCIA was um, employed here. Now, with the D DCIA, one trick you can do is you can keep the ASIS, but you have to, you know, keep a, a good portion there so that it doesn't fracture and that can be quite uh, uh, painful. So, and that also increases the pedicle length. Next slide, thanks. So this is the uh, cutting guides and now um, the cutting guides that uh, can be sort of uh, employed are the titanium ones, which have a very low profile and, uh, but the, co the cost is quite, um, quite substantial here. So uh, next slide, thanks. So we reconstructed, oh, we, sorry, we reconstructed that with the DCIA, as you can see on the bottom right-hand side. Thank you. Fantastic, Dr. James. Next slide, please. So uh, this is, uh, once again, uh, this guy had issues with his perineal artery as well. So that sort of uh, uh, should be, we, we should bear that in mind when I'm discussing this case. So this guy has had a hemimaxillectomy. He had a amyloblastoma, which was uh, quite uh, large and uh, up to the uh, flow of uh, the orbit there uh, as well from the sinus end of it. So he had a, um, a right hemimaxillectomy. So it's a fairly big defect. So you have the infraorbital rim missing and you have the alveolar bone missing and you also have uh, and it went up to the body of the zygoma as well so um, 
once again over here, uh, we decided to use a scapula and uh, you know, that sort of gives us good sort of, um, sort of form with the bone there. And also it sort of gives us uh, good muscle coverage intraorally. Next. Fantastic. And uh, Dr. James uh, has answered the one of the queries from the audience side. How do we assess the size of the defect? As he said, Stryker has given a pre-planning templates and other things. Uh, sometimes we may have to compromise in that uh, when you do a clearance point of view for the cancer patients. And the images will be cleared from the next slide onwards. And uh, the cyst, what type of cyst that you have done, Dr. James, that you have done a manual design? One of the questions from the audience side. All right. pathology, the cystic line, so, line <coughs> made a conservative management. Yeah, so it, it was an aneurysm bone cyst. And we sort of, uh, it, it was enucleated um, six months ago. And that's what it's shown. And it was um, unusually behaving very aggressively because it had recurred and it had also expanded uh, uh, more uh, towards the ramus of the mandible and towards the lower border. So, um, you know, uh, we rebiopsied it and it was shown to be uh, uh, ABG, uh, ABC again, but, uh, you know, we decided that, you know, he was going to get a uh, hip graft anyway. So uh, we just uh, took a, and it would be on the borderline of, uh, you know, the avascular bone sort of uh, working. So instead of taking any risks, because we're going to go through the neck anyway, uh, we decided to uh, do it as a free flap. Now, uh, otherwise, you know, yeah, I, I don't know what your thoughts are, but uh, generally, uh, if you are going to put a avascular graft there, you have to ensure that the intraoral aspect is uh, uh, nicely closed before you go in. Some people go in again and put the avascular graft. So uh, it potentially is two operations there. So while we are there, we just uh, plumb the vessels in. Fine. One of the questions from the viewers is like, what kind of place that you employ advice for the patients who are undergoing reconstruction following the cancer resection, not the benign lesions? And one more thing I want to insist on this is uh, Dr. James is insisting about the, not insisting, suggesting the uh, free bone graft only in the case of maxilla where the distal and all the other four, three wards are intact and the size of the defect is so small and you were able to achieve the primary closure intraoral without any soft tissue flap. You can do this free graft and later it is taken for surgery. That is, that's what he's insisting on this. But ideally you have to go for a vascularized free flaps for these kind of huge defects. Now, I request Dr. James to tell about the hardware that is used to fix the flap. Or, I mean, the implants that you place for fixing the flap. Uh, you go for a mini plates or reconstruction plate? So that's one of the questions from the viewers. Yes. Uh, yeah. Uh, so, uh, so for the previous one, the hip, hip one, we've used um, a printed plate. So uh, once we plan it, the company prints it and uh, it's a two, two millimeter thick thick plate that we've placed and uh, um, look it just gives me better sort of assurance for the mandible that you know I'm using a bigger thicker plate um, but you know people have people do use uh, mini plates and if you recall uh, for the scapula uh, that's what I did uh, but whenever I can I use a two millimeter plate a recon plate but for the maxilla, you can sort of get away with mini plates in, in my experience. Okay, now the message that is conveyed by the, pan, the entire panelist is maxillectomy defect, you go and reconstruct the zygoma and the alveolus which is missing in that with your bone. And the soft tissue component of the palate shall be reconstructed with the skin paddle that is incorporated with one of the flaps. Either it could be a iliac, a deep circumflex iliac artery flap or with your free fibula peroneal vessels and the those skin pedals can be incorporated to the palatal surface and the alveolus and the zygoma are reconstructed using the bony component so that the patient will get the harmony of the face as well as the alveolus to enhance the dental implant placement. Thank you, Dr. James. Next slide, please. Dr. Sakti, it's your turn to describe, please. Yeah, okay. So, hello, everyone. So, this is the case I'm presenting. This is a 53-year-old gentleman. He had been previously operated uh, for squamous cell carcinoma, left buccal mucosa. 
and the reconstruction was done using a nasolabial flap. You can see a uh, you can see the flap intraoral as well that he was reconstructed with nasolabial flap, and the marginal mandibulectomy was done at that time. Patient developed a second primary at the surgical site or you can the edge of the uh, the previously operated flap on the alveolus. We have done the biopsy. It came as a squamous cell carcinoma. Now we had planned for resection or uh, the wide excision composite resection of the whole bone because he already underwent a marginal resection. Next slide, please. So we had planned for uh, scapula free flap. As we have discussed, the points we have kept in mind uh, before uh, uh, the reconstruction is one, it was just a pure alveolus disease. And if we reconstruct the mandible, we do not need a skin pedal inside. Secondly, we, we wanted just pure osseous uh, scapula free flap with a cuff of muscle to cover the intraoral. Secondly, uh, if you see uh, the, the, the defect and the plating, we have used the mini plates for the fixation and the plate is totally covered with the muscle. So the chances of plate exposure are very much minimal if we do, if we cover the plate with the uh, the muscle, muscle flap or with the cuff of muscle. The next slide, please. And this is the post-operative result. You can see intraoral, the complete mucosilization of the muscle there. And if you see the extraoral, the symmetry, uh, the pre-operative and post-operative, it is exactly the very much same. We talk about the surgical site uh, the, or donor site defect or donor site closure, we can close it primarily. Only thing is these patients needs a physiotherapy for, uh, for some time so that their shoulder movements comes back to the normal. Next slide, please. And this is how you can appreciate the pre-operative and the post-operative photo of the patient. We have uh, the symmetry, how we try to maintain the same symmetry. Next slide, please. And now this is what I would like you to appreciate that this how the bone have undergone the fusion. It is fused with the parent mandible. You can see that the scapula is basically a cortico cancellous bone and we, uh, the, the architect or the curvature of the scapula, it mimics the mandible. So the thickness, the fusion and the form of the bone, you can appreciate that beautifully the scapula heals or fuses with the parent mandible. And if you can uh, see the bone height, it is adequate to put the dental implants in the post-operative or in the future. Yeah, that's all from me, sir. Fine. What made you to choose uh, scapula as the choice of flap for this uh, case, uh, Dr. Shakti? Okay, so, uh, yes, sir. We, uh, as I said, the first thing is, we don't want any skin pedal inside the mouth. Number two, the bone height, we, we, we wanted to have adequate bone height so that the dental implant can be placed in the future. Secondly, the, the, the morbidity of the scapula is very, very minimal. The third, as I said, if there's no skin pedal, there's no hair growth, there's no uh, skin taste inside the mouth. So these are the few points we have considered and definitely the Adaptation of the bone and the fusion with the parent mandible is better with the scapula rather than with the fibula bone. Dr. James, I would like to start with you. Uh, what is the choice of flap rather than uh, going for a scapula directly? Because Sati is the only person who is doing the scapula. Uh, how about the other options that you suggest? Yeah, look, uh, uh, Dr. Shakti, that's a fantastic result. Very good result. And... Uh, yeah, um, my my uh, first choice for this patient, I mean, uh, would be a fibula, uh, and my reason for that is, you know, I can harvest that flap, and um, at the same time as uh, uh, another surgeon's resecting the tumor. So generally, we work, uh, you know, in two teams here. Uh, so one does the resection, one does the reconstruction, and uh, you know, it just uh, it's. Uh, much quicker. So uh, for that reason, I would go for a fibula. And if you are looking for um, uh, muscle-only uh, 
flap along with the bone is uh, instead of the skin paddle. Um, yeah, look, you can use the uh, muscle uh, with the fibula as well and just use muscle only. And that's what I generally do if it's only an alveolus uh, component. And that's because of what uh, Dr. Shakti said as well. Um, but, you know, I, I, I have used um, skin paddle and uh, the patient has not received radiotherapy and th there was hair growing out of it. Um, so uh, what I've done in those uh, cases is actually just deepithelized the flap, uh, the skin, and it just mucosalizes quite well as well. Okay, Dr. James, one question from the viewers. Uh, since the case of recurrence of neck would like to previously operate it, what is the fate of the irritated neck for the scapula as long as the pedicle length is concerned? The question from uh, Abhinand. Dr. Abhinand yeah. Patur. Yeah. Sorry, um, sorry. can you just repeat that question? Uh, it, it was about radiotherapy, right? Radiotherapy and the scapular flap in terms of pedicle length is asked and finding the ideal recipient vessels. The, the, um, uh, the neck has already been meddled by the adenic oncologist. There, the, the corrupted exposure, everything is there. In, in such situation, what is, the, what is the chosen recipient vessels that needs to be considered for anastomosis? And what is the fate of the ped pedicle length of the scapula he has asked? Yeah, look, it uh, really depends uh, as to what part of the scapula you're using. So if you're using the scapular flap, the, um, you know, the pedicle length is going to be shorter. Um, but if you're using the scapular tip, you can get a few more uh, centimeters out of it, really. Um, now, uh, the beauty of doing that is because, uh, you know, the cancer surgeon is going to be taking the cancer out and you can't harvest the flap at the same time. So, uh, you know, you'll have a good appreciation as to what length you have uh, when you dissect your pedicle. And, uh, and you also, once the uh, surgeon has taken the cancer out, you can assess the integrity of the blood vessels and your uh, vessels that is uh, available. Now, uh, ge generally, you know, um, it, it's variable. So, so some people the, you, who get stony hard sort of... Uh, uh, next out of radiotherapy, uh, their vessels can be a bit hard to uh, sort of run sometimes, especially uh, the facial artery. So if you go lower down, generally, uh, because we use IMRT here, the radiation oncologist, they don't get as much radiation lower down. So, you know, uh, and if that's been reconstructed before, generally people go for the facial. So in, in my case, I would be uh, certainly considering uh, using a superior thyroid, but you know, it's whatever is available and whatever is flowing well. Um, so that's, that's my experience with that. Uh, now, with the veins, it's not a problem. You can go and do an end to side anywhere along the jug. That's not usually an issue. And one more question is like post uh, radiation therapy following microvessel surgery, when will you do it and when to, what is the ideal period for the flap to be saved, uh, Dr. James? Sorry, uh, you, you're doing radiation the flap? Radiation therapy follow, yeah. So then you're the doing the flap. Reconstruction and then sending the patient for radiation. What will be your ideal period? What, how long will you wait for the uh, wound to get healed and send it for radiation? Look, uh, I mean, our aim over here uh, in Adelaide is to get them to radiotherapy within six weeks. And we generally meet that. Yeah. Fantastic. Next slide, please. So, Dr. Siddharth, will you please explain this case and what is your uh, opinion on this? Uh, Good morning, everybody. This is a case of 55-year-old female patient has been operated twice for a parotid tumor. Later recurred with a pyomorphic uh, pathology was a pyomorphic adenoma, it's carcinoma. It was a huge tumor covering her almost our half of the face, starting from the zygomatic arch going up to the angle of the mandible. And she needed a radical uh, ablation of this lesion. Next slide. So the area of the defect was around about 20 to 20 centimeters. It was a huge area to be covered, along with a lot of volume defect on that side of the face. So we here decided to take a anterolateral thigh flap along with 
a good amount of vastus lateralis muscle to cover the defect and uh, next slide so for voluminous defects of the hidden neck the anterolateral thigh flap i think is one of the best flaps we can use as the patient on the table and as the patient almost 3 years post up now yeah now uh, lakshmi what is your uh, opinion about this case such a huge loss is expected uh, before resection and uh, to obtain uh, adequate clearance to get, get rid of this uh, ca uh, which results in a huge defect what would be your line of uh, uh, treatment for this case what is your choice for this so here here you, you have a defect uh, massive defect but it requires only uh, skin and uh, skin and some soft tissue so any flap that provides uh, adequate this amount of skin and uh, soft tissue it should be sufficient so the options will be uh, first option will be an alt so if there is uh, absent perforator or uh, something like uh, that then uh, we can always go for a thoracodorsal uh, artery uh, that means lat lat dorsi uh, Uh, myocutaneous uh, flap uh, otherwise the other thing will be a uh, rectus abdominis with skin dr shakti yes sir uh, i i just yes i agree with the uh, i think dr siddharth they have done a beautiful job and that is the best option available uh, to reconstruct such a massive defect uh, using the alt and alt gives a huge amount of the skin and the the vessels quality is also good so i think that's the best choice and the second choice as lakshmi said will be the ld flap i agree with the siddharth i would like to add few points in this i think it is a pleomorphic adenoma he said siddharth is it right it's pleomorphic adenoma it's carcinoma it has been operated twice and it come came with a malignancy later okay usually pleomorphic you know, for the benefit of the audience those who are uh, pg students and trainees they would like to highlight something on the pathology also this case the pleomorphic you know, seldom ulcerates even though attain such a big state of uh, size seldom ulcerate the skin that is a hallmark of pleomorphic you know, multiple quiescent nodular those things will happen within the capsule but not it, it seldom ulcerates it never ulcerates unless as he said unless it becomes a ca so in that case this itself the expanded tissue where and moreover you can't send the patient the lesion with the, the salivary lesions will not respond for your radiation therapy so you can safely do a resection of the lesion and leave it and do a primary closure if the expansion is good and excess, excess of tissues has been removed if it is a benign pleomorphic cardino please understand benign pleomorphic lesion where you need not worry about uh the radiation and uh, the the skin never ulcerates you can go for that is one way of doing this any opinion on this dr james would you like to add something on this yeah uh, look i agree with you all um um uh, it's it, it's a good case well done and um yeah look i, I my first choice would be a alt as well there's uh, no doubt about that um uh, i would uh, yeah, i would use the vastus though to reanimate the uh, face there i would uh, coapt the um uh nerve to the vastus to the masseteric nerve there and uh, i would uh, yeah uh, i would also put a gold weight in the eye if uh, i i assume the nerves being sacrificed here given that okay. it's carcinoma so it is a radical parotidectomy and you can put a alt flap that is the choice that's right dr james yeah fine and uh, <clears throat> what is the Uh, recurrence rate with this such a doctor siddharth what is the recurrence rate you have put a flap on this now we place a flap and what will be your recurrence of uh, this is such a doctor now it is a t4b lesion mm-hmm. right it's almost 3 years now uh, we are keeping uh, him uh, her under uh, very good observation she is coming every one month to us okay. there are, there are, there are high chances of recurrence of a t4b lesion as we all know Fine. so the, the thing is that we have to keep the patient under good quality when the patient gives a good follow up to you and there will be every 6 months we are doing a ct scan to evaluate the particular local regional any recurrence there or not dr james one general question from the viewers 
preference of anastomosis which will you do it first first is artery or vein if it is artery why and if it is vein why can you please answer oh. this previous question look uh, it it doesn't matter which one you do first uh, i guess it matters which one you re release first uh, when you're uh, running the flap um, it's basically whichever vessel is deeper you do that first and just make your life easier there should be no hard and fast rule as to which you should anastomose first next next slide please yeah this is for uh, dr siddharth again yeah it's so this, a rich, yeah yeah Carry this on. patient had a radiotherapy previously or a buccal mucosa ca and he recurred back into the ITF, almost T4B. We did it, we did back in Savita Oral Oncology Department. Um, the patient underwent a huge resection, and I'm all with the buccal mucosa, uh, part of the mandible, the maxilla, and along with the ITF clearance. So again, this is a huge defect of the midface. So as these are in, the, uh, we get a lot of this here back in India. This Indian cancer patient don't report early though. He went to a center early, had an operation, had a recurrent. So we need to reconstruct this bit defect. And again, Austin, next slide, please. Our flap of choice was our anterolateral thigh flap along with the vastus. And that, that reconstruction was done, and that is the post up of the patient in front of the flap as he will. So the facial skin is preserved. You have reconstructed only yes, the infratemporal fossa. Yes, yeah. sir. Only the infratemporal fossa part of the, the, the vastus was used intraorally. Yes, sir. Yeah, you prefer intraoral. I mean, the to fill that uh, infratemporal region, you take uh, incorporate the muscle flap also in that. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Because there is a huge disc space which has to be covered, which covers the base of the skull. Okay. That can be done nicely with the vastus laterally. Okay. Doctor Lakshmi, please pass your. Comment on this. I want to know one thing whether infraorbital uh, uh, bone is uh, sacrificed, the rim, the globe. No, the, no, the globe support was intact. intact. Okay, we just did a support from the, the, the That is not a radical one. The, the globe support was there. Okay, so it's the infrastructure maxillectomy. Yes. Okay. yes. Okay. So uh, then uh, the only question uh, we have to think is wh what the patient wants here whether he is very cosmetically oriented that uh, he requires his uh, alignment, mandible back, all those things. So if, uh, if not, then uh, a soft tissue flap, any soft tissue flap, which can provide adequate bulk into the infratemporal fossa and uh, support to the cheek skin should be sufficient. Or if the patient is very uh, oriented towards cosmesis, he wants his mandible alignment back, then we have to get uh, his condyle uh, ramus segment, but uh, any osteocutaneous plus, preferably a fibula, if he wants. So I'll take the patient uh, uh, what he wants in this consider. That will be the other priority I'll be thinking. Dr. Shakti. Okay, so one thing I would like to just ask Dr. Siddharth is how do you uh, uh, probably, I mean, make the nasal lining do you just leave the muscle there or you have covered with the skin, uh, you know, the inside skin, you have put it anything like that? No, no, no. I've just kept the, kept the vastus lateral is there to cover the whole nasal lining and just close the skin with the opposite side palette. Okay. So I think in my opinion, there are uh, two kind. Uh, if we want to rehabilitate with the bony reconstruction, the uh, fibula can be used for the bony reconstruction of the maxilla. And if you're going for the soft tissue, I think ALT will give uh, a very good bulk uh, and uh, the uh, cover the defect. Infratemporal infra defect can be covered. Fantastic. Yeah, next slide, please. Now, uh, again, Dr. Siddharth, please explain. Uh, this is a young male patient, 32 years, came to Savita Hospital uh, with a T4 lesion again, at this time it's a T4A involving the buccal mucosa cheek and part of the mandible. He underwent the composite resection with AMR ending. Um, as, and we, the next slide. And the choice for this man we did was a fibula flap. Uh, we 
had we had uh, this man had two perforated skin petal so one skin petal was used for the intraoral reconstruction for the buccal mucosa and the other petal was used for the cheek defect the one single flap with two different perforated basically the next slide And that's the donor side which has been grafted and this is the immediate post of the patient on the table so next slide and that's the patient uh, so now two years now as the immediate post of and after radiotherapy you can see closely still there hair growth as the other panelists told that is the problem with the fibula but a nice uh, both intraoral and extraoral closure along with a good uh, uh my mandible new mandible can be given to the patient with a fibula along with the skin pedal next slide so that was the flap monitoring we did okay immediately after 24 hours day 2 and and day 3 okay we here you use in our unit the pricking test let's just see that how the color of the bleeding. Next slide. Next slide. Yeah. It's not Go back to the previous one. Go back to the previous one, please. Yeah. Now, uh, let me ask something from uh, Dr. James. Uh, being a young patient, we are able to do all this uh, osteomyocutaneous flap. If it is an elderly patient exceeding uh, maybe 60 or 70, where, uh, as you said, in the first case itself, if you anticipate some kind of uh, uh, vascular changes, like uh, sclerotic changes happening in the, usually happens with the lower limb. So, elderly patient, compromised lower limb vasculature, what will be your uh, choice? And is it mandated to do free flap for all the cases, as we all keep on discussing so far? So, what is your... Uh, uh, suggestion for this, Dr. James Padilla. So, yeah, uh, look, um, uh, that's a good question. So, basically, what we do is we discuss all our oncology patients at a multidisciplinary team sort of meeting. Uh, I'm sure you guys do too. But uh, one of the um, uh, people that's integral to that part is a physician. And uh, any sort of elderly patient who has uh, comorbidities or even a younger patient with comorbidities, we refer that patient to the physician and uh, also the anesthetist. So that patient's worked up and we just sort of come up uh, uh, with some sort of, um, sort of knowledge about whether the patient is fit for a, a, a general anesthetic, which would include a, a, a free flap. If, uh, you know, if it's, if they're not, then, you know, potentially, you know, we would just let them swing and just uh, bring a soft tissue flap in there. Uh, but generally, you know, even if they're elderly, they're optimized and, uh, you know, we would reconstruct them um, optimally with a free flap when, when possible. And that does happen uh, in a, good proportion of patients. Uh, if their lower limbs, once again, is, uh, uh, you know, if the perineal artery is calcified or, you know, they have uh, peripheral vascular disease, then, you know, scapula would be my choice here. Okay. Dr. Siddharth, what was your, yes. uh, what is your mode of uh, cooperation of these vessels, anastomosis of these vessels? What do you suggest and what is your experience on this? Sir, uh, we did the, uh, facial, uh, we did the peroneal artery with the facial artery, and I think one of these cases we did we did use a, use a coupler for the anastomosis of the vein with the common facial vein. Okay. So, Dr. Lakshmi, what do you prefer method of anastomosis? You want to do a conventional suturing or any other methods you want to try on this for the benefit of the PE training so that they will uh, okay. get enlightened. And uh, I think you will be a better, uh, better person to tell about couplers and all. Uh, we follow in our center only the conventional anastomosis, whether end-to-end -end or end to side, with slight modification in the way we uh, anastomose it. Otherwise, we only follow the uh, conventional method of anastomosis. 
what is your order of stenosis so which one you will do first artery or vein All, always vein? always artery then you release vein. that why you do the finish the artery and stenosis artery, and release it release any principle behind this you want to tell on this or the, just, the, uh, just so we want to check the flow from the uh, uh, vena committens or you mean uh, that back flow yes and proceed accordingly uh, select the vena committens and then anastomose the vein uh dr james uh what the uh, one one more questions uh, one a few questions from the audience side one is the, what is the age limit for harvesting a free fibula plug because being a maxillofacial surgeon we commonly do this uh, free fibula plug uh and everyone should know about this also so with this i would like to ask some of the questions based on the audience queries one is minimum age and maximum age of uh, free fibula plug and one interesting question is if the patient is <laughs> patient with polio what is the plan for fibula if at all fibula is the only choice dr james sorry uh, yeah look uh, well i haven't uh, done any free flaps for pediatric cases so what is your uh, maximum what, what is the minimal age uh, so, patient you have yeah done? minimal age yeah look uh, maximum age there's no maximum age if uh, they're fit for an operation uh, then you know certainly we want to rehabilitate them and you know it depends on uh, uh their life expense uh, you know we consider uh, what why we are doing it as well so if uh if this is a medic for example if it's a medication related osteonecrosis of the jaw and the patient's got a pathological fracture now uh you know technically you'd go and do a fibula potentially but you know if they have uh, if they have breast cancer which is metastasized then that's why you know uh, they they on some sort of bisphosphonate which has caused this problem and if their life expen- expectancy is not very long uh it just sort of uh we shy away from that so if uh their life expectancy is long there's no real and, and they're well to handle a uh, general anesthetic then you know there's no age limit uh doc lakshmi based on your previous answer one question has come from the viewers uh in case of delay between the harvest and the anastomosis do you uh, do artery first and then uh, let the flap uh, perfuse for a while is it okay is ask one one of the questions uh, from that side we, we always do the artery the first thing we anastomose is artery always okay. so based on the dr siddha's case one is soft tissue reconstruction following this play morphic granuloma and it has become a ca lesion multiple time attempts have been made to uh, resolve that uh, pathology uh, he has done a alt flap such a voluminous huge long span flap that has been done what uh, what we suggest is 1 gram of tissue require 8 ml of blood per hour to what 8 ml should go per gram of uh, tissue to go inside and come out from the flap based on that Uh, such a huge span of flap of course he has achieved the result with a single anastomosis for the vein whereas uh, what we uh, uh, for the safer side what we insist is like go for a dual venous anastomosis of the vein alone so that uh, and the second is choice of the donor I mean the recipient vein the vein facial vein will be your high caliber vein try to do a end to side anastomosis rather than end to end anastomosis for the safer side when the suction power is more with the ijv or common facial vein definitely is better than the uh facial vein uh, or the smaller veins so in that cases go for a high caliber vein for doing a, uh, performing the venous anastomosis preferably end to side anastomosis and we all know that we all get exposed with the carotid sheath and clearly seen is your uh, ijv so when you do that the, you can uh, alleviate the complication associated with the venous uh, anastomosis to a greater extent so go for that as all the participants insist on the artery anastomosis first followed by this as lakshmi said the first is restore the circulation to the flap immediately and you can check the back flow once you do the artery anastomosis release the clamp you can see the back flow the flap is getting restored with the blood and coming out as a venous drainage that is a clear indication that you done a perfect anastomosis second is ischemic time is reduced once the flap is filled with the pure blood uh, so that the flap survey will be high and the third message that i want to tell from my side is like there are multiple methods have come to do anastomosis not only with the conventional but also with your couplers micro staplers and laser anastomosis are giving very promising results nowadays and very easy for to for the beginners even the beginners to perform that laser anastomosis not much time is taken and another point which i would like to add from the flap point of view is you craft the flap you 
design the flap in the donor side itself before you divide the pedicle before if you do the division of the being a beginner i'm telling so being a beginner in the uh, flap harvesting you do all the carving you just you know how much defect has been created in the head uh, neck or uh, facial side so in that place you just assess the flap and make a template or if you have a prefabricated template fine that if it doesn't work then you can go for a uh, arbitrarily making a defect size and transfer that template to that flap and carve the flap so that no adjustment should be made in the face you should just fix that partially inside the flap and do anastomosis this will greatly alleviate the ischemic time the maximum ischemic time that is given is the minimum will be 111 remember triple one is the triple one minutes is allowed that is maximum was 2 hours or upper limit will be your 3 hours not more than that if it is exceeding this then the chances of the flap outcome will be reduced by 10 percentage of this flap so 3 hours of flap ischemic time multiple methods are available do the flap crafting in the uh, donor site itself and reduce the operating time fine next slide please tough uh, lakshmi this is your chance to describe on this so uh, this is a 50 years old man with uh, ca lo lower allulus the anterior uh, uh, arch area so it was t4 uh, a n2 c disease so uh, was uh, the, actually the lesion was extending on to the uh, the skin of the the skin over the chin and it was reaching the floor of the mouth so uh, here we got a defect uh, anterior arch of the mandible floor of mouth as well as the skin over the chin so we uh, proceeded with uh, fibula so it can provide the adequate bone and the skin to uh, for the both mucosa as well as the skin Uh, we actually planned anastomosis for this case on the left side so we went for a uh, right sided fibula osteocutaneous flap so why we went on to the right side is we want always the septum superiorly we don't want the septum to come inferiorly the, if it is coming inferiorly the mobility is restricted and uh, there were no two perforators it was a single perforator flap so we harvested it large and deepthalized to create both the mucosa as well as the skin Fine. Next slide, please. And uh, this is the post-operative outcome uh, with adequate uh, oral seal and nicely healed skin. Fantastic, fantastic results. Uh, Dr. James, Dr. Lashmi was telling about the contralateral side. Do you have any side preference for uh, uh, grafting the, I mean, putting the flaps, or if it is a left side, go for right side? Is there anything that there if it So, what is the cause for that? Can you please explain that? Yeah. Uh, look. Um, generally, if you want, um, you know, intraoral coverage, uh, you, I go for the contralateral leg, uh, and that's uh, as why you know Dr. Lakshmi said you want the septum to be in a favorable position. Um, if it's skin outside, then you go for the same uh, for the ipsilateral uh, leg. But uh, you know, if you can't use, so say for example, uh, you, you can't use a leg, and it's uh, you, you are forced to use the leg that you don't want, you can overcome that by actually um, having your skin pad a bit more superiorly. But you have to dissect the pedicle a bit further down so that this, uh, it does have that freedom uh, that you need to uh, put the flap the the skin paddle where it should be okay dr siddharth you want to say anything on this side do you prefer or you just stick on to whichever is feasible at that point so the, so the contractual side as dr lakshmi said is always preferred to give a good internal cover thank you dr siddharth Again, dr dr shakti any any suggestions on this side selection so it uh, it depends on the uh, the quality of vessels uh, probably and the the inset of the flap which decides the uh, where i'm going to uh, do my anastomosis and as uh, dr james said sir uh, ki if we have the restricted mobility we can dissect down the perforator and we can have we can increase the mobility of the flap yeah i want to add something on this the selection for the contralateral side what is insisted by robert ackland is 
choosing the contracted side even for the rat anastomosis is telling that when we the harvest the flower from the lag, uh, rat stay uh, the valvular flow is coinciding with the contracted side that is the main point they are insisting on this all these uh, anticoagulants have been uh, invented because for that only once you detach the flap from the leg with the vessels the, the valve becomes non functional so what happens that act as a impediment for the blood flow to that against the resistance if you take the ipsilateral side that is what it is insisted then they tried with all the anticoagulant local, local anticoagulant when, when they do the venous re- anastomosis and as rashmi said the septal position is diff- easy if it is to do intraoral then it is difficult you have to roll the flap so that the perforator alone can 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 uh, get uh, uh pink uh, sorry pink so what happens so th- th- there will be a giving a false results false uh, signals from the flap so for that that is the idea of doing this otherwise there is no side rest- uh, side uh, restrictions or selection based on this given by uh, uh, greenberg greenberg textbook of uh, cranial maxillary facial surgery by Do- uh, greenberg you can go through the side selection is not a matter for doing this Ap- apart from the practical issues there is no side selection if at all the patient doesn't have one side then you have to go for the ipsilateral side most of the time so this is for the pgs to get informed on this okay next slide please uh some of the cases which uh, just you want to show this is the case of verruccous carcinoma which is involving the almost except the skin every part is uh, and the angle of the mandible is angle of the ma- mouth is involved so for this uh, we did a wide local excision next one next slide please and reconstruct the radial forearm flap since radial forearm is not dealt much i have put this the, this case a simple case of uh, radial forearm flap you can see the appreciate the pinkish color of the flap and uh, slightly there is this colors mismatch cosmetic uh, consideration should not be given a priority for any kind of uh, flap reconstruction just we are giving a uh, basic seal for the oral cavity so that uh, not much of communication between from the one one channel to the other channel especially when you reconstruct the flow or the cheek saliva is the greatest poison as you all know which will never allow the wound any kind of wound to get healed so in that case we need to give a, just a basic seal so those kind of things problems can be addressed by using this though it is a very quick carcinoma it almost skin has, has to be excised and we always do that uh, 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 flap which is uh, which is which is having a pliable skin which can cover both the skin and the mucosal layer next slide please uh, this is how outcome after a few months and then next slide and this is the patient is uh, giving his opinion about this flap next slide so with this uh, let me wind up the session for uh, today uh, it's a fantastic uh, panel discussion that we had uh, all this one hour hoping uh, all the uh, participants will be benefited out of from us so i want to highlight few things uh, from my side one is rec- uh, cancer has become the most prevalent disease in the indian population the recent uh, oral cancer uh, conference they have found out that 30% of the oral cancer is only in india the rest is 70% is uh shared by the other countries in the globally so cancer has become the integrated part of the maxillary patient's life uh, I mean, treatment part of uh, maxillary facial surgery so when you come across those kind of lesions the conventional methods of doing non uh, and the primary closure or sometimes uh, free graft or uh, uh, those things cannot be uh, sufficient to address uh, such a complicated issues so in such conditions you need to know about the free flaps and the at least the local regional flaps which is going to be dealt in a different session so with this uh, i would like to thank dr reena john the president of tamil nadu aomsi and dr jimson the most dynamic secretary who is conducting this uh, program very with, without any flaws for all these times with the hectic uh, pandemic issues and uh, the entire team of tamil nadu aomsi national as well as local branch and uh, our uh, panel head dr suresh sir for this uh, wonderful uh, organization and answering all the queries from the audience side individually i should i should thank dr james badrani for this spending so much of time with us to share his experts without any hassle and he is patiently answering from the time of we got introduced to each other uh, and he is describing each and every step why why he is doing all this thing all the cause and effect of this 
uh, methods and substantiating everything with from his part and uh, dr siddharth one of my colleagues dr shakti diora is one of the busiest uh, microvascular surgeons in india who is doing lot of cases and dr lakshmanaran is the upcoming rising sun of this from the next generation i'm really proud to have you all and thank you one and all for this wonderful session thank you madam thanks a lot dr dr sendil sendil yeah me here uh, yeah you are the head of the team not me okay <laughs> yes small correction and uh, uh, because we have little more time can we take up some questions from the question and answer section yeah yeah why not one most yeah one. yeah the first one is my one question yeah please to you how common is the peroneal artery calcification because the first case i think it was started with the peroneal artery calcification and uh, do you so, routinely test it and how do you check it yeah uh calcification whether there is a calcification or not i or i always subject all my fibula patients to go for a ct angiography for various reasons so okay. not only there is a peroneal artery magna what is peroneal artery magna for the benefit of pgs i would like to say posterior tibial artery comes out from the uh, uh, anterior to the septum is called anterior tibial and posterior to the septum is called posterior tibial the posterior tibial artery has to give one more branch called peroneal artery which is supplying the fibula okay and the idea of taking this uh, ct angiography is just not only to rule out the anomaly in the vasculature but also to the level of division see if the level of division is just below the fibula head then you can take adequate length the entire fibula as given the textbook can take it suppose if it is coming division is taking place at the foot level or just ahead of the foot level then there is no point in taking that flap because we may be have to reconstruct the mandible or maxilla from mandible to angle which is exceeding almost 10 cm and you have to make multiple osteotomies on this so those parts will utilize lot of uh, pedicle so what happens the posterior tibial if it is giving in the middle it is fine if it is going much lower level then it is a challenge for this those things is best seen in your ct angiography the second the ct scan will show you the bone architecture also okay and as you asked about as the age advances the calcification becomes inevitable in some patient very hard working people which have having a high work uh, lifestyle those people are very prone for this instead of going for a sedentary lifestyle and the uh, other patients and the third what we observed from our is diabetic patients will have lot of peripheral angiopathy in which it is commonly seen in the perforators not from the main branch of the peroneal vessel that's why we have observed in this that's what they insisting on earlier mobilization earlier mobilization of the patient after doing so irrespective of whether you put a skin graft or not you have to go for a earlier mobilization of the patient okay. even if you put a skin graft what the literature says is we wait for one week until the skin graft takes up then you go for what what the recent concept says is like you have to mobilize the patient especially the, the patients who be and the patients in diabetes so those things if you support with your anticoagulant therapy it's respective of your calcification the extent of calcification of course matters the extent of calcification is best to see your dye which is injected for ct angiography itself will not go if it calcification complete obliteration is taking place so okay. the radiologists immediately say this is not the case for those things so ideally instead of doing a ct and j the ideally instead of doing a, a doppler just to check the post ct bill alone you go for a ct angiography though it is expensive and you can compromise with your charges so that the patient will have a hassle free uh, this thing and you will come to know what kind of uh, anomaly you are having in this so not only the peroneal artery magna is giving a trouble but also the calcification as you said as the age advances dr james you want to add something on this uh yeah uh, dr santo that that's uh, yeah perfectly said i don't have anything to add to that dr lakshmi um nothing to add sir except for like uh, the uh, artery branching is the main thing as we all know it is like one type 1 type 2 type 3 branching and type 3c is our main concern which is the arteria peronea magna where uh, there is absent posterior tibial and the peroneal artery is supplying the plantar arch if in this case if by chance uh, like without uh, pre operative evaluation if we harvest a peroneal artery the chances of lower limb ischemia and uh, loss is high so that is why uh, pre operative ct angiogram even though it is uh, less than 1% um, uh, some systemic uh, reviews they uh, suggest doing a ct angiogram for pre operative evaluation when we are going for a fibula dr shakti 
please uh, highlight on the CT angiography or any other pre uh, uh, pre operative uh, investigation that you employ to overcome such intraoperative complications. Okay, so we are not subjecting all the patients for uh, CT angiography, but yes, we are subjecting the patient for color Doppler. Uh, as you said, the financial constraint is one of the big thing in our country, wherein you know we need to uh, look after the charges uh, also. And next thing is, uh, we definitely consider the age, the systemic conditions like the diabetic status of the patient, and any other related systemic vascular morbidity has been considered for CT angiography. But if uh, the color Doppler says us all good, we don't usually go for the CT angiography. So. Fine. And one question from the viewer side. One is that protocol for post-operative management of uh, flap salvage using anticoagulant, either heparin or clexane or deltoprin. Uh, Dr. James, I would like to invite you to answer this question, please. Yeah, look, uh, if uh, there's any doubts um, about the flap integrity, uh, it needs to be taken back to theater and explored, essentially. Uh, or, you know, uh, at least at the bedside. But uh, the, I don't like to rely on anticoagulation as such, just to wait and see what happens and uh, the flap, you know, will slowly die. Uh, I um, don't um, give, you know, therapeutic heparin for these patients. I just give them prophylactic uh, uh, anticoagulation um, unless I'm doing a vein graft. Dr. Siddharth. Yes, sir. Yeah. So in the post-operative management, uh, let us say that keep the patient in normal tension. His systolic pressure should be above 100. That you should monitor upon. The, temp the core temperature of the body, the core temperature of the patient's body should be maintained. That you should also see the urine outflow of the patient. So that the fluid electrolyte balance, this all has to play a major role in the microcirculation. And giving an anticoagulant, it has got a lot of controversies. In some centers they give, in some centers they do not give. With different depends also on the operator preference. Another thing is that we have seen here that our patient, uh, when you are doing a microvascular anastomosis, you should keep our patient's head straight. And we should turn your head right and left. Even at least, at least, at least my eight to ten, though you can mobilize them, this also can lead to thrombosis rather than relying on the other factors that giving them clicks and giving them heparin. Dr. Sakti. About anticoagulant, systemic or local, what do you want to insist on this? Anticoagulant uh, yes. or just account to the physical vasodilatation? Yes, sir. As, as, Dr. Siddha, as Dr. Siddha said, it is definitely institutional protocols. Uh, different institutions have different protocols. But what we follow is we give the micro span for the 24 hours after. You know, we start the time of surgery and we give for 24 hours till next day. And then we give the claxin for next three days. So this is the protocol we follow at our centers for anticoagulant therapy. Okay, I second all your opinions. Uh, I would like to add something with the Siddharth's opinion, the temperature maintenance. The flap survival is not only depending upon the surgeons or the vessels. Or it's a multifactorial. The team should not think that they should leave home by 3 o'clock or after, not more than that. Should be ready all the time to explore the flap, number one. And flap ischemic time alone is not playing a major role in success of the flap. The other factors like the temperature of the flap. AC room, we are working in such a high-tech air-conditioned room where the temperature goes below 18 degrees. Definitely the flap can, any kind of flap, any surgeon cannot give a, a best outcome. Though we place a, a body warmer under the patient, if the local care is not taken. Once the flap is detached from the side, that will go for a condition in a different way. The condition of the flap by the AC is playing a major role that we observed in this. So 24 degrees centigrade is the uh, basic uh, temp room temperature that can be maintained. And multiple people should be awarded within the theater. That is a major factor that we uh, always uh, insist on this. So we should try to avoid those kind of things, not only from infection point of view. There are some hemodynamic changes that is happening with the patient, those who are undergoing such a major procedure. At all, if you want to in incorporate in the institutions like this, you can have a relay from like so many advancements have come. So you can relay directly from the theater to the audience so that they keep away they will be at bay to watch all these things and we can pass questions in fact this. And the third is anticoagulant. The amount of anticoagulant that reaching, as uh, to Siddharth said, that just for the DVT purpose also, you try to reduce the infusion of this uh, anticoagulant, systemic anticoagulant. The anticoagulant, if you are uh, ambulating the patient the second 24th hour or 48th hour, there is no need for such kind of these things. 
and the amount of anticoagulant given for the purpose of flap survival or uh, thrombolysis of the flap to get infused properly is very minimal amount is reaching the minimal dosage is reaching to that level in that you can do a lignocaine hydrochloric 4% lignocaine plain lignocaine otherwise called as loxic powder whatever it is they do that that gives a chemical dilatation that too has some resist, uh, restrictions you should not keep on giving a raw lignocaine hydro for a long time the rebound phenomena will come back once you stop giving this after 45 minutes to 1 hour it rebounds and goes for a spontaneous vasospasm so all these factors should be taken into consideration and then you have to go for this and for the uh, and uh, and flap vitality and uh, what is the uh, dr james uh, there is one question for you uh, is there any bone scan uh, related issues so that you can salvage early detection of complication of the flap and you can go for a uh, uh, addressing the flap what i i observed is like bone scan can only be taken at the end of 10th day or 12th day once the inflammation subsides then we subject the patient for bone scan so that you will not get a false positive results in the flap cases which is not going to be helpful after the 10th day if the 10th day if the flap is not doing well there is no point in taking this what is your opinion on this taking a bone scan for bone only flap please why, why i am asking this question is being a dental surgeon we do lot of benign lesions rather than the ca lesions where we take a bone only flap where bone only flap is alone is required not incorporating just for the purpose of monitoring the flap we just take a bone alone flap without skin paddle and we bury the flap inside we will not be knowing what is happening in the next 48 hours so in that case they are insisting for a bone scan 10th day only we can take the bone scan what is your opinion on this yeah look uh, i mean you can do a bone scan after 10 days as you say but i don't do bone scans uh, for uh, bone only reconstruction uh, all my patients get dopplers uh, so implantable dopplers um, so i know that the vessels flowing uh, so that's that's my take and you know um i guess we are fortunate because in the public sector you know the 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 patient doesn't have to pay for any of the surgery and uh, all this is covered and in the public system uh, the private health insurance absorbs these cost hey, dr lakshmi we want to add something on checking the vital area of the bone only flap for benign lesions there we don't take we need not take skin paddle at all just for the monitoring purpose okay. instead of cost hope you understand what i am asking yes sir that means uh, the submerged flaps you are asking yes yes okay the advances uh, there are a lot of advances in monitoring of this flap uh, yes. the thing uh, the implantable uh, doppler is one where uh, we can uh, we can implant the doppler right over the vessels but the thing is we should be monitoring both the artery as well as the vein so artery alone monitoring is not sufficient when there is venous thrombosis and uh, venous thromb venous uh, monitoring will say like uh, if the blood flow is less there is some arterial issue or actual thrombosis is can detect the other things will be uh, laser doppler uh, flow metry uh, and uh, uh, one more uh, thing is there but the thing is implanted implanted uh, doppler will uh, do the thing for the Sir, I'd, I'd like to add one point with this. Yeah, yeah, please. Sir, in the Indian scenario, we don't have a implantable Doppler. We, I think when you're doing a benign lesion also, we can take a small cup of skin and just keep it internally to monitor. Or so you you that, insist on skin panel for all cases? No, sir. Irrespective of the requirement. Uh, irrespective of the requirement. Yes, sir. A very small cup of skin just for... Uh, just for the monitoring because we do not know actually if you don't have the implantable doppler is it dependable is the skin pad alone is dependable the half no, of sir, the thing that no sir the skin pad is not dependable sometimes we okay, what, what i audience the, means is what i am asking is is skin pad alone dependable because he is telling the perforator which is arising from the main vessel which is having a more than 2 mm of thickness that the perforator is less than half the thickness of the flap will this match with the vitality of the bone inside that's what i'm asking him for that no, sir, it it will it will always not because there are there are there are cases where the bone is intact when we have not the skin pedal and the area is left to be less to be granulated so just we can take a chance that's it sir. a small skin and we sometimes may be a good indicator okay what is the complication rate associated with uh, any kind of flap doctor uh, james please how do you 
address complication early late intermediate those kind of complications salvage how would you do just three few points about from your experience yeah look uh, uh, basically uh, flap monitoring is uh, very important we have to take care of the patient holistically uh, uh, as well so um, flap monitoring you know everyone would be monitoring the flap so if there's any doubts uh, at all then you know early take back is uh, the best way to do it um, I get my patients to mobilize very quickly. Um, in fact, you know, for the fibulas as well, I get them to sit out of the bed the following day and start getting them to mobilize uh, as soon as they can. Um, now, in regards to, um, you know, actual flap going down, then, you know, you use uh, uh, thrombolytics, I guess, intraoperatively if uh, you have a clot and you're not getting a flow back, uh, but, you know, you don't want to wait for that. You uh, you get in early. Fine, Doctor Lakshmi. Flap salvage. How to manage early? Which is the ideal time? Golden hour. Anything else you want to insist? Uh, the first th man monitoring of the flap for the first three three days is at most important. So usually it is. Uh, uh, said that we should monitor every hour in the first 24 hours and fourth hourly for the next two days. And we have to monitor both for the, that is the clinical uh, monitoring. Monitor both uh, for the artery as well as uh, venous issues. The venous problem will be very easy to diagnose because uh, the flap turns a little blue, the uh, edematous it becomes. There will be some oozing from the peripheral edges of the flap. So that is the way that naturally it starts to decongest. And uh, arterial problem is difficult to diagnose and the delay happens during recognition of arterial thrombus. And the salvage rates also, the venous thrombosis salvage rates are more than arterial uh, salvage. So uh, best thing is to, when we diagnose any venous thrombus, Immediately, right in the ICU, uh, open up a couple of stitches and then cut open the anastomosis so that uh, it's, the flap uh, starts draining and there will be uh, some uh, venous outflow will be there and the congestion will be less. Artery, uh, you have to take and start uh, redo the anastomosis with a uh, good uh, flowing uh, adjacent artery. If artery works and the flap perfuse well and good, or if there is a microvascular uh, thrombosis or edema at the zone three, zone four levels, then it is a real problem salvaging a flap. Dr. Shakti, flap, flap exploration. You want to add something on this? You want to highlight something? Dr. Shakti is out of. Dr. Shakti, Diora. Dr. Siddharth. So the best thing I think is a post-operative flap monitoring is a team which works regularly. Right. So they, your staff nurse, your colleagues who are operating with you should be well taught to see the color of the flap first. What we do in our institute is we put a sterilium in a hand just and just go and touch the flap and see for the temperature. First, the temperature of the flap, the core goes away. So that is the first one of the first indicators. The flap may not be warm. And of course, the I think the first three hours to four hours is very important when the flap has the, the flap is deteriorating. The, you should actually have a different theater always ready at least for three to four days. Next post operatively, so you can take your patient immediately to the OT and just not to wait to find that this is coming, we have to wait and all. Okay, Dr. James, uh, being I mean, hailing from a dental background, we want to undergo training in microvascular surgery or free flap surgery. Uh, what kind of training you insist for the aspiring people that, uh, those who want to execute the microvascular surgery? What is the training protocol you insist? And what, what is the time limit for that? How long they should stay? That's the common question from all the viewers from the uh, PG training space. Um, so, I mean, yeah, look, I, I can't speak for what, uh, you know, uh, apart from my experience here in Australia. Yeah, your experience, that's not about, yeah. So, uh, 
over here, you know, we, we are duly qualified now. And um, so for us, I mean, if you want to do any form of head and neck surgery, we uh, undertake a head and neck fellowship. Um, it, you know, it's actually quite um, collaborative in Australia at the moment. It's getting that way. So it, um, so I did my fellowship in uh, Sydney. So it's it's a institution where general surgeons essentially do all their uh, uh, head and neck oncology and also their own reconstruction. So. Um, you know, they're very well sort of uh, open to people from different backgrounds. They take plastic surgeon, ENT surgeon, max pack surgeon, general surgeons into their fellowship program. Um, so uh, essentially, you know, if you want to do all this, uh, I would recommend that you, you know, uh, look at a head neck fellowship, uh, which offers these sort of uh, opportunities. And, uh, you know, then you have a logbook which substantiates your training and essentially you can do it. Fantastic. Uh, so any, any queries from uh, the... Uh, yes, Dr. Santil, there are some more questions. Uh, yeah, please, 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 please. So Dr. Vigneshwar wants to know what is Allen's test and where is it used? Um, can you throw the question to any of the panelists or you can answer yourself? Allen's test and the importance of Allen's test. And somebody wants to take the, take the question. You want to say something? You want me to answer, sir? Yeah, yeah, please, please, please. Okay. So the Allen's test uh, is like uh, uh, it was described way, way back, but we what we use is a modified Allen test. Actual Allen test compares between two two arms, but uh, modified Allen's test compares the uh, flow between the, the contralateral circulation from the ulnar arch. Uh, first, we we'll ask when the patient is uh, sitting, we ask the patient to uh, uh, tighten the fist and then we occlude both the ulnar as well as ladial arteries. And then uh, we, we ask the patient to open the uh, fist. And when you release the ulnar circulation, you should see the perfusion in the thumb. It is like it should happen, the perfusion should happen in three to five seconds. So then we can uh, tell this there is a uh, contralateral circulation from the ulnar artery and we can go ahead with the uh, radial forearm flap. So three to five seconds uh, should be, it should, it should, we should see the perfusion in three to five seconds. You can use uh, Doppler also when you, while doing the uh, Allen's test. You're not only feeling with the uh, digital yes. pulsation. You can use the, uh, uh, the also no, color no. changes. So yeah, yeah, that is okay. enhance your test, and you will come to a decision whether to go for this or not. And how do you prevent uh, wound resistance, uh, Lakshmi? By when you are doing, because the most commonest uh, complications happen with your. Uh, though it is the easiest flap, uh, all the complications uh, will come with your radial for a flap, and giving a very anesthetic uh, outcome for all the patients. Uh, how to overcome that? How to prevent the skin loss which is placed over the donor site? So we have to give utmost care in preserving the paratenon over the FCR and the PAMR is longest. So if paratenon is preserved, then it, the graft will take up. And the other thing will be immobilization of the wrist. The forearm is, should be immobilized so the bed is not mobile for the graft. So these are the only two precautions we should take for adequate healing of the donor site in radial forearm flap. Okay, Dr. Badalani, you want to say something on this? Any modification that you want to try? Have you tried with your radial forearm? Conventional radial forearm flap, have you tried any modification with respect to the defect size? Say, uh, for example, if we have a bilateral oral submucous fibrosis, in that case, conventionally what we can do is zero mouth opening, you need to do something for with the flap we have to take a bilateral radial forearm flap. Instead of that, uh, what we, we give a bilobed flap actually. We take a bilobed flap. Like that, any modifications that you would like to uh, highlight from, from the radial point of, radial flap point of view? This one question from the viewers. Addressing the bilateral submucous fibrosis. Sorry, uh, your your question is uh, what uh, modifications I would yeah. do to the flap, yeah, yeah, uh, exactly. the flap harvesting. Yeah, yeah, exactly. 
Yeah, look, uh, we, we don't see much of uh, submucous fibrosis here. Um, yeah, uh, but generally it, uh, the flaps that we raise from the radial forearm free flap is just basically, um, you know, fairly standard ones. Sometimes um, I include a bit of a, a beaver tail. So if I, I, I take a bit more of the uh, subcutaneous tissue around the pedicle, um, but apart from that, not, uh, it's fairly standard for us. Okay. Sir, any questions, sir? Yes, sir. <clears throat> so, so we did discuss a case uh, of maxillectomy and reconstruction option for that. We discussed with the uh, scapula flap, I think. Uh, so there is a question on the best reconstruction option after total maxillectomy. That is, I think the viewer means uh, total maxillectomy is along with the uh, floor of the orbit removal. It's not a bilateral maxillectomy, I think. Okay. So which will be the best uh, reconstruction option and which are the neck vessels that will be used for anastomosis after a total, total okay. maxillectomy? Dr. James, you want to take up this question? Sorry, uh, so, so we're talking about a hemimaxillectomy, uh, total hemimaxillectomy yes. defect with uh, orbital rim. Well, yes, well, you know, I think uh, my, my choice of flap <laughs> would be a scapular tip there. Um, you know, it just gives you good form and it just, uh, it, 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 you know, uh, with, with a, um, uh, you know, and with the reconstruction of the orbital flow, I would just put, you know, either a native bone or a, a med bow in there. Um, vessels, you know, it, it depends which one you can get access to. Generally, it'd be, you know, higher up the facial and, uh, you know, the facial artery and the facial vein, perhaps. And uh, generally, I would do an end to side uh, to a vein as well, when, uh, RJB as well. So I always do two veins. Okay. Well, whenever I can. Uh, yeah, that means you want to bring the vessel mm -hmm. to the neck via the cheek is it that's correct and and you know sometimes uh, uh uh yeah that that is right and i come from uh outside the mandible so it's within the cheek but it's on the lateral aspect of the mandible that i feed the uh, vessels into the neck uh, shakti what is your uh, yeah, yeah yeah shakti what is your choice for reconstruction of the maxillectomy defects reconstruction yeah, so, of the palate alveolar zygoma total maxillectomy defects you know, okay. If we are removing the infraorbital rim, the best uh, uh, portion to reconstruct is what we do. We cut the coronoid and we, we swing the coronoid below the orbit. So we fix uh, the coronoid process at both ends. It's, you know, it, that coronoid and makes the floor of the orbit. We fix the coronoid process there. And rest of the ma maxilla can be reconstructed using the free fibula flap wherein we can have a buttress region, we have the alveolus region, and that has to be covered with the skin pad also. The anastomosis, as we said, we have, uh, we need to, uh, uh, you know, bear the bone a bit and take the pedicle into the neck. So the anastomosis either can uh, can be done through the, uh, the uh, superficial temporal, or it can be through, uh, done through the, uh, the direct branch uh, into the, from external carotid, we can do the direct uh, anastomosis or it can be done through the facial vessels. And definitely the vein is the IJV. And uh, if we need to do the twin anastomosis, we usually uh, take the extensive regular vein also for the anastomosis. Fine. Adding to this, uh, iliac crest with the medial plate can also address some of the issues with the maxilla. Though the alveolus part is taken care by the iliac crest and the medial part of the ileum will be taken care along with the iliac crest mm -hmm. for uh, surfacing the you know, palatal portion of the uh, defect. That is one way of doing this. Of course, we all discussed so far the short of the shortness of the pedicle plays a, a greater challenging role in the reconstruction using the air press. Otherwise, what uh, Dr. Shakti and Dr. James are highlighting is can go for a fibula flap with uh, uh, and uh, the challenging part is you have to bring the pedicle between the cheek and the buccinator so that uh, the compression should not be executed. When it comes to the neck vessel anastomosis, that is one, one of the challenges that we need to know. So, so anything else, sir? Yes, and it's a good explanation. I think it answers the question. And if we are performing a bilateral maxillectomy, 
bilateral maxillectomy do we have to harvest uh, uh, two free flaps from either side or can we manage it one free flap from yes. ilia uh, or scapula <clears throat> dr shakti how do you want to face or dr james whoever is finally i'll give my Uh, for total maxillectomy i think uh, if it is infrastructure maxillectomy we can uh, very well do if uh, uh, the soft tissue free flap we can take a radial forearm free flap and we can just reconstruct it and because we have not experienced uh, the bilateral maxillectomy defects okay. yet it's uh, probably a very rare entity but if That's we right. want to recover it we can use the radial forearm after this Yeah, I'm, I must say I've not come across a total, true total maxillectomy defect. Uh, but uh, yeah, I must uh, agree with uh, uh, Dr. Shakti. You know, I would probably, uh, if it, if it's such a big defect, I would put a uh, potentially a soft tissue flap, uh, and you know, uh, if they want rehabilitation, put some zygomatic implants. but then the question comes about if they're losing the operative flow as well yeah you know, it's it's just a fairly uh complicated scenario yes yes sir i second this these two opinions i never come across this but usually what happens with uh, we have seen a uh, maxillary necrosis resulting from the osteotomy total maxillary the leafort one level that we address with the fibula only fibula osteocutaneous flap okay. reconstruct the alveolus with your uh, bone and the soft tissue component will take care of the palate we don't reconstruct the ashi spot of the heart palate so we just give a diaphragm for that and put a dental implant that is the one thing and never come across bilateral match the case okay. okay dr sanju thank you and there is a question on neck dissection in recurrence cases because in the primary surgery itself the patient has undergone neck dissection so if there is a local regional recurrence you will do wide local excision but will you address the neck also once again or we ignore that part dr siddhar can you please sir. take this question so this is reconstruction session with question so there is a uh, question on no. neck but i said <laughs> it's, an, <laughs> it's an after the right interesting person, interesting question so yeah yeah so, so what is the question can i beg your pardon is recurrence uh, in the neck right yes no 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 recurrence in the neck recurrence in the primary site local regional okay. recurrence Okay. but uh, when you operate for the second time when you remove okay. the recurrent lesion will okay. you do the neck dissection once again because the neck is already addressed at the time of the first surgery so will you do neck dissection once again during the second surgery or you ignore that part so when a patient having a secondary recurrence always go want to go for a pet scan okay to to, to find out is there any neck recurrence or not okay right and if yes. it is not there i will i will not go for any neck dissection neck dissection not necessary okay no okay. yeah okay okay thank you i think that explains and the next question is on skin graft if we lose the skin graft in the donor site that is the fibula how do you manage after harvesting fibula we give a skin graft if there if the graft does not take up do we repeat the skin graft or is there any other way we can solve this problem uh, yeah do you want to answer somebody else want to take this question the the, uh, the skin has gone in, uh, out from the fibula it means yes donor side yes. they are doing skin grafting donor side grafting yes the skin, he has he has lost the skin graft yes so we should always go back okay put a white good dressing Okay, and okay. leave all the granulation tissue, and we'll again to put a next skin graft. Okay, no need to do a second skin grafting for the patient. Yes, sir. we we preferably yes. Okay. Preferably, otherwise there will be a lot of scar contracture here. Okay. Okay. And the gait of the patient may reduce. He might have a hypertrophic scar. Okay. And lose the mobility of the tissues. Yes, Doctor Siddhar. So we assume that we have to do that only, sir. Uh, Doctor Lakshminar highlighted that whatever skin graft you are doing, put a very good plaster of Paris yes. all around. Yes, reduce the mobility. Yes, reduce okay. the mobility. Okay. Yes, thank you, Doctor Siddhar. And uh, one more fascinating question: Which is the best textbook to read free flaps, Doctor Sendel? Encyclopedia <laughs> of free flaps by Grab. By Grab. List, yes. list is there. Huge list is there. Arcane is there. 
no we don't have time to read all the books we want to know which is the best all available uh, online now soft copy is there yes the, you can go okay. for the arcane or uh, v v san mardini the famous book on three flaps mardini and v samir mardini was done the face transplant and the future okay. and v okay. those book is the constructs the bible mathes classic series flap physiology is fantastic given in this uh, robinson smith that is again uh-huh. the best book to read that Yes. So those books are a lot of list is there. I can send the list of books. Yeah, you can send it to Doctor Jensen so that he can post. Yeah, them. I'll I'll do that. Yes, I think uh, one one last question. I think it is on um, reconstruction plate alone given after a resection mandible, but the patient needed a radiotherapy. After that, there was an exposure of the skin or the plate, recon plate. and uh, sometimes the plate fractures also after the radiation so what is the salvage i think shakti so do, do we repeat the recon plate or we go for a free flap at this time why free flap was not done for the case that matters uh, the question doesn't mention <coughs> address about that yeah why not, none of the low origin mm-hmm. flaps were not considered yes when i like to put uh, when you are putting a recon plate yes. the soft tissue cover should be very good Yes. At least put a local regional flap there. Okay. But in case a bulky flap like a very good flap is a pick major, is very easy to harvest and always you can wind that flap along the recon plate. Your chances of exposure will be less. Okay. When you are sending the patient for a radiotherapy, only with a soft tissue skin cover and with a mucosal cover. Yes, Even sir. you don't do radiotherapy, sir. Sometimes the plate get exposed because okay. of part contraction and radiotherapy, the area uh-huh. becomes fibrous. Yeah. The flap should be given. Okay. Do we but, really need to put a if at all if at all if you play, plan to go for a pick major, do you really want to put a plate in this? Why don't you think about uh, taking care by the uh, pick major itself is suffice for uh, prevent the arch collapse with yeah. the mandibular reconstruction? No, mainly so the lateral side of the uh, the lateral defect of the mandible can be easily taken care with a pick major, mm-hmm. as is traditionally done in lot of institutes. Mm-hmm. The problem comes only when is the when is okay. in the anterior segment. that has to be restored along with the fibula only otherwise there will be a lot of difficulties and the plate get exposed later dr james uh, would you like to say something on the radiation related to fibula flap after fibula flap radiation yeah. issues radiation issues following the fibula flap free fibula flap yeah look I, i personally have not had any uh, issues but yeah look i have heard of uh, uh, my colleagues and uh, uh, having issues with ORN like it's like any other uh, i mean native mandible if it's going to get ORN you, you, I mean, it's just a uh, uh, it just makes sense that you know fibula is also susceptible to it so you know you have to make sure when you reconstruct this area it's got nice soft tissue over it and uh, uh, you know that that's all you can do uh, you know so, some some places now as uh, uh they resect the bone and just just put a spacer in there for uh, the bone uh you know it's just uh made out of peak and they do a soft tissue free flap and after the radiotherapy is done uh you know 6 to 12 months later then they generally 6 months they take the spacer out and then they go put another bony flap in there so some people have started doing that over here yes uh, what happens with us is like uh, the mandible the vital mandible alone can stand for only uh, 6000 centigrade or uh, less than that not more than that if it is uh, exposed to more than that such amount of radiation the live mandible itself undergoes uh, uh, ORN so in such being a thick bone it's like a very fun task the fibula flap despite of having so much of vascularity after doing the anastomosis Uh, this we get exposed definitely so we have to restrict on certain things that is a double edged sword which can go anywhere it is sakti what is your point on this yes sir uh, as uh, uh, dr siddhas has said we, we need to cover the plate adequately whenever we are doing a reconstruction but sir in our practice we are not putting plates without a free flap so we are not putting a plate and covering with the soft tissue Uh, at our institution, that is not in our practice. Some flap, some flap should be there. That's yes, some is. flap should be there. We are using free flap. Our mm-hmm. most of the reconstruction, ninety percent of the reconstruction is free flaps. 
and we use the recon plates for uh, as uh, already dr james sir said for the mandible and we are using the uh, mini plates for fixation of maxilla sir sandal yes sandal so we are almost done with the questions actually so you can take over for concluding words and you can hand over to dr jimson later thank you very much yeah thanks a lot once again for the, all the all the panelists dr james dr lakshmi dr shakti dr siddha uh, madam dr ina john and dr jimson for this honoring me by keeping me as a moderator for such a complicated uh, session uh, really thankful to all for me to get exposed so many things i learned from the other panelists as well uh, so dr J james i am again thanking you for honoring us to taking part in this wonderful session and uh, sharing your knowledge with us as well as the participants those who are on online so once again i thank the entire team thanks a lot thank you very much for having me and uh, you've done a wonderful job dr santu and uh, well done dr lakshmi and uh, dr shakti and dr siddhat um thank you. Yeah. Uh, you 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 all should be commended for the work you're doing thank you sir thank you very much professor badlani thank you dr jims thank you uh, dr okay. veena yeah yeah thank you thank you all thank you, sir. Uh, so uh, so i dr. think john to I think that was a fantastic session. Thank you so much, dear panelists. Each one of you have done a fantastic job, and uh, you've let us get a glimpse on uh, the kind of work a maxillofacial surgeon can do. And uh, you've made us understand that uh, you know the limitation of our surgical scope is in the mind, and every one of us can. And if we put our mind and um, into it, we can do what. what you are you you guys are doing thank you so much for the discussion very very simply put usually microvascular surgery most of us who are listening here would be in awe and would be um, you know wondering what you guys are talking but uh, we seem to understand the language that you spoke and that's fantastic that's that's the important part uh, dr james uh, in spite of the fact that you work with with the latest technology you took the time to go through our mock run and uh, you know uh, and through this panel discussion and come to uh, come to understand the situation in which dr shakti and dr sendhil and dr siddarth and dr lakshmi are working in not with the technology that you have but still doing such fantastic work Uh, and uh, you know uh, spending that time with us to understand us to teach us and to share your experience uh, i really thank every one of you here for having uh, shared your experience your technical tips that you would have learned over the years uh, you know just by by uh, the words that you said you've inspired us not not threatened us and told us that no you guys cannot do it but you have actually inspired us and i'm sure many young guys who are listening here are inspired to follow your path your footstep thank you so much for being here with us if i'm allowed to ask one small question before i leave i i i, I mean i i know you all are microvascular surgeons you all have you all have patience so if i can ask dr jimson can i ask a one single question yes, sir, please am i allowed please. yeah uh, have any of you seen recurrence within the you know the the flap within the uh, fibula that you have uh, you know recurrence of the lesion maybe malignant or benign within the flap that you have uh, singo yes, i yes, i yes, happen to yes. see it though i don't do uh, microvascular any one of you or yes, all of you in the recurrence of my patient in a fibula flap but not in the bone it is in the skin paddle in in the skin paddle okay anybody else dr james me too me too me too me too had in the soft tissue the bone it's in the skin paddle okay. i think dr lakshmi uh, wants to answer uh, dr lakshmi <laughs> yeah, 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 no, yeah, I, yeah we had ma'am we had so i could before you can complete i can tell that we had that uh, recurrence over the skin paddle uh, okay and, skin uh, paddle and we have re resected that skin paddle uh, with margins that's the okay. way we went it and oh, okay. and uh, left the remaining to granulate on its own ah uh, okay what about you doctor Dr. Shakti, is did you no, come? No, we we have not faced any uh, these kind of uh, recurrences. Uh, okay, okay. Lucky Dr. man. Dr. James, Dr. James, anything that you have yeah. come across? Uh, no, no, I haven't. No. Um, not not in the bone, uh, okay. but I have. Um, you know, for okay. because we have a lot of high incidence of skin cancers, and um, I've seen a recurrence within an AOT that uh, we did. 
uh, oh, this okay. very aggressive disease. Yeah, 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 yeah. So I saw a whole fibula disappearing with a recurrent amyloblastoma. So I was wondering uh, where after five years in a fibula. So I was wondering whether any of you had things. So thank you so much. Thank you very much for your precious time. And time, I think, is the best gift that one can give another individual. And you guys, in spite of, uh, you know, operating even now in co during COVID, I know you are operating. And the time that you must be spending in the OT, in spite of that, spending time with us. Thank you so much. I appreciate every one of you. Thank you, Dr. James. Thank you, Dr. Sendhil. Thank you, Dr. Shakti, Dr. Siddharth, you, Dr. Lakshmi. Of course, Thank Dr. You, Suresh and Dr. Thank Jimson. You, Mayank and... Uh, Chandru and Anish Roy, thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you, ma'am. Thank, thank, thank you, everyone. Thanks thank a you. lot. Thank you, Sandhu, Thanks, Dr. James, Siddharth, Shakti. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Thank you, Dr. Thank you, Dr. Lakshmi. Thank you, Dr. Lakshmi. We'll catch thank up with you. Soon. Thank you, Suresh, sir. Goodbye. Thank you so much, Dr. Lakshmi. Thank you, Jimson, sir. We still have all of them hanging on. <laughs> all the participants we still have, still have um, you know, yeah. most of them usually leave and we still have all of them hanging on. Lunch thank time. you so much. Have a great <laughs> Sunday, the remaining Sunday. Thank you. Thank you, thank you. Thank you Dr. Sindhil, for that wonderful moderation. Thank you. Yes, Dr. Sindhil. Jimson, thank you. Thank you, Jimson. Thank you, ma'am. Thank you, sir. Thank you, thank, you, thank you, all. Thank you and look forward to everyone's uh, yes, participant the company in three weeks. Uh, yeah, next Sunday. Yes, I'm sorry I missed that. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I've already shared the feedback form in the chat box. Yeah, I was excited about this. I forgot about the next Sunday. <laughs> <laughs> I forgot about the next Sunday. <laughs> yeah, thank you. Thank you so what much. What was the topic for next Sunday? Thank no? you, Dr. James. Principles of resection. Principles of resection. Fantastic. Thank you. And Non-microvascular flaps, yes. local regional okay. flaps, and distant flaps. Yes. Non-microvascular. Yeah. Sir, please share the right. link for that. Yes, we will. Yes, yes, we will surely send. In the same group, we will send once again in WhatsApp. Yes, we. Yes. Thanks, everybody. Thank you, sir. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you, Dr. Bye. 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 Jim. Jim, sir? Yeah, Jim, there was a mistake today from my part. Um, I could not introduce Professor Badlani and uh, Dr. Shakti Diora because I got the information very late. So no it was very embarrassing to me. I'm so sorry about it. I, I never had details of them. It, I, it, it reached through mail only in the morning, so I couldn't prepare a few words about them. Yeah, I a few, few uh, questions being asked about the certificates. One minute, uh, I mean. Okay. The certificates, uh, you will receive, the participants will be receiving the certificates before September 30th uh, for all the sessions of uh, secondary deformities. And the recording is available in our YouTube, uh, www.youtube.com. Slash C slash Max Facts Talk. And today's recording will also be available uh, by tomorrow. So that's for the benefit of all uh, the participants. In case if you have missed out, you can visit the YouTube channel and uh, watch all the webinars and including your Ask Your Mentor sessions. Those are available there. Subscribe to